for the message. All right. And I think we are live. Good morning, good evening, everyone. Welcome, dear audience members, to Trust in a Virtual World, a panel whose topic is more relevant than ever. Um, how do we gain trust in today's world? How do we maintain it? How do we restore it when it is lost? The extraordinary circumstances brought about by the global COVID-19 pandemic and the acceleration of digital lifestyles have forced us to shift gears and to look at the world with fresh eyes as conventional wisdom and trust are eroding many aspects of our lives. According to the 2019 Edelman Global Trust Barometer, government and media today are the most distrusted entity in the world, with 47% of the general population distrusting them respectively, up three points from 2018. Furthermore, there is also a widening gap of trust between the informed public and the mass population. The informed public has a trust index of 65%, the average of their trust across NGOs, business, government, and media, while the mass population has a trust index only of 49%, resulting in a high trust inequality index, further supporting the fact that the world is also divided on not just who to trust, but what to trust. So first, let me start by introducing myself and each of our esteemed uh, panelists today. My name is Freddie Covington, and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of Visa in Asia Pacific. I reside in Singapore, and I am currently finishing my doctoral dissertation in Global Leadership and Change. My area of research is leadership studies, particularly in the context of Asia, where I am documenting the emergence of a new leadership paradigm, which is more collective and digitally connected, that I call connectivist leadership. My first panelist is Dr. David Miller. His brilliant paper called Restoration of Trust is the basis for our conversation today. David, you want to wave and say hello? Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Freddie. It's great to be with you. And good uh, morning and good day to everybody. Great. David, you're based out of Florida in the U.S. at the moment, and you're the director of the Faith and Work Initiative and a senior professional specialist in ethics and lecturer at Princeton University. In addition to your research, teaching, and program, you also serve as an advisor to corporate CEOs and senior executives on ethics, values-based leadership, culture, and the role of faith at work. Before receiving uh, his PhD in ethics and joining the faculty at Princeton University, David spent 16 years in senior executive positions in international business and finance, including eight in London. As a thought leader, many senior executives seek out David's counsel um, in many different parts uh, of uh, the spectrum. And an article in the Wall Street Journal recently featured his work. Um, he was referred to as the on-call ethicist. Uh, so we are very uh, excited to have you on call with us uh, today, David. Thank you. Thanks again. I would also like to introduce uh, Jane Lynn Baden. Hi, Jane. Jane is based out of Shanghai in China, and she's the managing partner at uh, APAC and CEO of Publicis in North Asia, one of the world's largest advertising and media conglomerates. Jane was an entrepreneur of a technology startup before joining um, the agency, and she spent 20 years in digital technology and the communication industry. Privately, Jane is also an exceptional individual and a fellow of the Aspen Institute International Leadership Program. She has a heart for social ventures and social justice, especially in the service of women and kids in the sex trade. She and her husband did something amazing. And they took their daughter on a one-year sabbatical in 2010 to work on ministry services, and they launched a program called Project 86 Plus to support fair and sustainable uh, coffee trade in China. Welcome, Jane. Well, thank you. And finally, uh, Felipe Amaral, who is based out of New York City in the U.S. and leads the civil society outreach for Philip Morris International to shift the company towards a smoke-free future. Felipe works with the transformation department at PMI to develop specialized communications with civil society. He's responsible for PMI's dialogue with actors across the globe in development, science, and academia, to support PMI's corporate transformation process. Previously, Felipe worked for the UN, 
FIFA and an international was an international policy advisor for the Brazilian government. Such a great background, very okay. widespread. He also speaks so many languages: uh, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. Welcome, Felipe. Thank you. I'm honored to be with y'all. So let's start the discussion with this very um, esteemed uh, panel. Uh, I'd like to start with you, David, if, if you don't mind. I um, sure. absolutely loved reading your paper. I was mentioning to you we had a particularly richer brunch conversation this weekend than <laughs> usual, <laughs> referencing your paper towards a restoration of trust. Uh, you start your paper by saying that we cannot walk out the door without entering into a series of exchanges structured by trust. Um, so is a propos to ask you, it seems like everyone these days is talking about the lower levels of trust in society. It refers to the Edelman barometer and a lot of broken trust. Um, and in your paper, you take a rather unusual approach to addressing these issues. Tell us a little bit about that. Right. Well, first, thank you again. I'm, I'm honored to be with you and those who are, uh, who are listening into this panel. Uh, yeah, the, the, there are so many people who think about trust. I'm not the first one to have written about it. And by the way, let me give a shout out to my co-author, Michael Tate, a colleague of mine at Princeton University. We wrote this paper together, commissioned by uh, PMI to explore this question. It's not about them. It's about the wider phenomena of uh, breach of trust. And I became more and more interested in the restoration of trust. Not, like We all know that trust in all of the nations around the world to varying degrees in various ways, there's a greater and greater suspicion, as you mentioned, in your, out, your in distrust. Uh, and so I began to think, well, how do we restore trust? And, and I was having a, a lunch with the, the COO of PMI, and, and he said, you know what, no one trusts us anymore. And I somewhat rudely said, well, there's good reason that your industry, your industry sector has had a lot of challenges over the past few decades. And after a, a, a little laugh, uh, he, he said, well, what do you think about it? And I said, well, there's one area you may want to look at that very few people think about. He said, that, what's that? And this is the subtitle of the paper. Uh, the subtitle of the paper is is Insights and Lessons from Wisdom Traditions. Insights and Lessons from Wisdom Traditions. And the idea there is to look at different, and I want to accent different religious traditions or philosophies, and to say, well, what wisdom could we learn from them that might be a, a new counterintuitive, a, a transformative way or transcendent, if you will, way to think about this, this age-old question of how do we restore trust. And to, to manage scope and scale, we, we picked three uh, large traditions, the uh, so-called Abrahamic traditions, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, uh, and looked to say, well, what, is there anything in common in those? And we, we interviewed uh, scholars around the globe in every single continent, male, female, people of color, everything, these different traditions. And it, by the way, let me stress, this is not about religiosity. This paper is not trying to convince anyone to become this or that. It's just to say, where can we find sources of wisdom? Just like you could find it in Shintoism and Confucianism and various different different philosophies. So it's just to scope and scale, that's where we picked this. Uh, and I think the, the what we've discovered as I've talked to people around the globe about this, including presenting it at Davos back in January, people were very interested. Well, what is this wisdom? What is this different way of looking at it? restoring trust. So that's Thanks a bit of how this came about, yeah. Yeah, and do you want to tell us just a, a little bit more from, um, you know, from the uh, Abrahamic traditions, you talked about Judaism, Christianity, and, and Islam, maybe um, some of the dimensions of these ancient sources of wisdom. Um, I think you list off 11 in, yeah. in your paper, but maybe you want to just draw on a, on a couple to give us an example of, of these sure. sources of wisdom. And one thing that, that quickly became clear amongst these three traditions, and I would argue most of the world's uh, spiritualities or traditions or, or philosophies, is, is, is this. At their best, they acknowledge that humanity is not perfect. They acknowledge that humanity makes mistakes at the individual level, at the family level, at the, let's call it, tribal or community level, and at the institutional level, and even at the, the global level. We're not perfect. But all these, these philosophies, these wisdom traditions, at their best, give a path back to healing, a path back to wholeness, a way to restore a broken and corrupted relationship. That's what really intrigued me. So just take one tradition that, that people might be familiar with, Catholicism. There, there's an actual rite or a ritual called confession, and that's a way to sort of clear the slate and to have a way forward. And there are many other ways. Uh, so we, we identified 11 different theses or ideas that would be uh, that we could find secular language to draw on these different wisdoms. Uh, so so, so what, what one, for instance, is, uh, is, is to talk about 
a covenantal mindset. So different religious traditions, they refer to having a covenant between God or gods and, and their people. And this covenant is it's different than a contract. It's about relationships, not transactions. So you form a covenantal relationship. Well, how could a company who's, let's say, breached trust with their clients or their regulators or their accountants or whomever it might be that they're different stakeholders or investors, uh, how can they, in this highly legalistic world, learn from the idea of covenant and develop covenantal relationships as opposed to legal transactions? So that, that's one way, one example of a, one of our 11 theses, in fact. Uh, uh, another we talked about was was transparency, and that's not new. Every organization and the best consultants will say, well, of course, you need to be transparent. But part of the way we describe that, and we learned this from the different religious traditions, is you invite the offended party back into the conversation. So you're showing respect. You're showing that you understand the pain or the anger that they might have, and you invite them back into the conversation. We learned a lot from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. I talked to people there who are part of our some 30-odd people we interviewed around, around the globe. But each one, it might have come out of one tradition, but immediately the other tradition said, oh, yeah, we, we think about that, too. We might have different vocabulary or different underlying uh, theologies, but we agree with that same point of wisdom. Um, maybe great, one, yeah, so one we'll more? take it as a start. Yeah, maybe my, <laughs> one more book. I, I, won't, I won't do all 11. Um, we, 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 we know the, the phrase, uh, sort of people talk about having a conversion moment or a religious conversion, and we played with that as a metaphor that, that the conversion implies usually a dramatic, humbling moment, a dramatic, humbling mm-hmm. moment. So some companies, and I'll focus for a minute on companies, but it could be other organizations, it could be NGOs, it could be governments, it could be the private sector, it could even be religious institutions. Sometimes there's a gradual decline of trust through, through small breaches, which finally become overbearing. Other times there's one cataclysmic event that just makes everyone go, whoa, I'm not getting on that airplane again or I'm not going to buy gas from that the mining company or that, that oil and drilling company. We think of a BP or a Boeing, not to pick on them, but just as examples. So mm-hmm. the question that we learn from the religious traditions is how do you use that humbling moment? How do you lean into that pain, own it, and really have a conversion, not just of like your uh, just one person, but how does a whole institution say, wow, we really have to, we, could, we don't have to beat ourselves up, but we have to be humbled, and what do we learn from this? But it has to be everyone, from the CEO to middle management to the rank and file work on the front line. Uh, and if you do that, you know, there's a bit of a cliche, never waste a good crisis. Uh, and, re- and religious institutions seem to understand that, that a community can be made whole again if everyone uh, takes the lesson out of it. Thanks, David. I thought, I thought these 11 theses were fantastic. And, you know, as a uh, scholar of leadership studies, I thought that they, their relevance was extremely uh, appropriate also to leadership. And I was thinking that would make for a very interesting paper also to talk <laughs> a little bit about the principles of leadership coming from these Abrahamic conceptions and, and practices. Maybe something yeah. you and I can, can work on together at another time. And I'm I'll send you a little chat message on that for later. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I'm actually really glad that you, you talked about the first one, the uh, covenantal relationship, because it leads me to um, asking something to Jane, you know, in the context of A- Asia that you know very well, Jane, and that you have worked in for many years. What does trust mean in this cultural context? And do you see perhaps different dimensions than how it is expressed in the West? David talked a little bit about um, the, the importance of contracts in the West versus um in Asia, you know, it, it's more uh, the word that you give each other. So interested to, yeah. to note maybe some of those those differences, perhaps. Yeah. Well, thank you, Freddie. I, I think that's exactly that uh, when David was talking about, it re- really resonated with me, is the power of covenant versus power of contract uh, in Asian culture. Uh, my observation is that I think the, the starting point, maybe it's not about building the trust, it's maybe the starting point of trust in the, in the many of the Asian culture is slightly different from the Western culture. That also explains quite often when we see even, nego- if I take China as an example, some, uh, quite often the negotiation that done by international company in China have been proven quite difficult simply because the, the, the starting point of trust is very different. I would say that in, in China, in many of the Asian culture, the starting point is actually distrust. 
when I say distrust, it means that actually the organization individ individual expect the other party to prove they are trustworthy before they uh, award the trust. That means there's a, there, there needs to be an inner circle to make sure this trust actually being established first. So quite often people talk about Guan Qi is actually more about that inner circle trust. Whereas my observation is that in the Western culture, often that you give the benefit of doubt. You, 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 you start, your starting point is trust. Your starting point is that you do this and I trust until you violate that trust. So the starting point is different in Asia. That also is, I think, the fundament because I'm working in advertising and also communication industry. I think that mindset has a fundamental impact on how brands operate in Asian culture because brand has to realize the starting point is distrust. So the brand actually has to do extra, extra more to, to close the gap first before they can become a trustworthy um, brand. And so from that perspective, it's almost like the contrast of, um, say, the power of covenant, co power of contra uh, contract, but also that explains why, for example, social commerce is very uh, advanced in China in some of the Asian culture is because the entire commercial mechanism is ba built based on the trust and trust has a lot to do with this virtual trust circle and that related to the social as well. So I think that there is a, there's a difference between how trust is built uh, in Asian, in many of the Asian culture versus in, in Western. Uh, I think that in the Asian culture, trust often is built on seeking for safety. That shows that the consumer are looking for safety. Uh, people are looking for safety versus many of the trust built in the Western culture sometimes about future opportunities. Can I get a future opportunity? Can I get a more a future benefit through that relationship? So I think there is an underlying difference here. You know, Thanks very much. I just say yeah, something ahead, quickly. It, it reminds me there's a, there's a phrase in the in the West. Maybe you've heard it. Um, Fooled me once, shame on mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Fooled me twice, shame on me. Mm -hmm. So it's it's this different assumption of what is a starting point of trust or distrust. Interesting. Yeah, it's funny. I was thinking of exactly the the <laughs> same thing. Um, and you know, amazing to 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 kind of understand that different cultures are starting from you know a different different basis. Um, and how that can have impact on on things that you know are not necessarily easily related. I loved how you took that to the social commerce. Um, very you know very relevant in terms of how the economy is, is certainly building um, in, in Asia. Yeah. So, Felipe, I want to turn to you. Um, you know, coming from the tobacco industry, obviously you have a large experience in, in other domains also. Um, and you know, wanted to, to ask you a little bit. You know, on these issues of, of safety and sort of like this, the, the starting point when you're in a company, an industry um, such as PMI. Uh, how do you manage this 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 trust journey? Can you take us a little bit maybe through what you have been through and how you are thinking about um, perhaps restoring or, or, or rebuilding if there is such a thing? Thank you, Freddie. No, absolutely. And I want to take the points from both David and Jane. Uh, David's point about humility and a humbling moment, if you will. And and Jane's point about starting from a point of distrust, because that's where Phil Moore's is restarting right now with its transformation. If you allow me to take a step back in 2017, the company um, pledged that you will shift, it will shift away from cigarettes to better alternatives, as we call them. The company invested for over a decade in products that will cause less harm than cigarettes. And our message to society was clear. It's basically, if you don't smoke, don't start. If you smoke, you should quit. But if you're not going to quit, transition to a better product. And that was our message to civil society. But um, as both both pointed out, this message itself is not enough. We got to show up constantly with consistency with civil society from a point of distrust. So we are not only having to prove ourselves to earn that trust, as Jane mentioned, but also to kind of be an active, to have an active role in civil society as a positive corporate actor. So that's the point where we are today. And that's why Philomar is investing so much in sustainability, in equal pay, um, we're investing in and um, SDGs and how to make the company more aligned with the global goals because it's not enough to have a positive agenda if you're not listening to our 
to others, if you're not participating in positive agendas with civil society, and if you're not showing up in an authentic, a consistent way. So I guess the lesson that we've been learning is, okay, you have a positive agenda as a company or as a sector, but that's not enough. When you come from a point of distrust, you also have to show that you're playing ball, that you're you know, acknowledging other people's causes and you're partaking them as your own. So that's how you show up a little bit more authentic. Okay. And I think um, that's been the challenge for us in terms of setting, you know, or start our starting point being from a point of distrust and, 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 and basically evolving from that. Great, great bridge. Um, and you talk about listening and you also talk about making investments. Um, David, I want to go back to you. One of the things that struck me when I read your paper was how fickle and difficult the concept of trust is, because fundamentally you say when it is intact, it's invisible. <laughs> so it's one of those things that's very difficult to restore, as Felipe says, because if you're good when it's invisible, then you only know that it's not good when, when it's already too late. <laughs> so you know, how, are there any lessons um, for restoring trust, which is obviously the, the title of your paper, um, and how do you go from, you know, the the the, the invisible to, to to the visible? To the, well, how do you go from when, when it's gone visible, which is bad, yeah. to invisible again? I thought that that was really fascinating, quite difficult to kind of comprehend. Yeah, I mean, there's this. Um, it's embedded in the social framework and the networks we have, both at the personal level, the the community level, the organizational and societal level. Uh, and yet we all know when it's broken, but how do we make it where we don't think about it again? How do we just know because it's mm. invisible? What, what, one thing that, that came out clearly in, in talking with these different uh, traditions, wisdom traditions, is that it takes time. And I don't mean mm. time solves all ills because uh, it doesn't, but it does take time because someone, particularly if they've been seriously injured or a family member has or a, a devastating breach of trust, just because you say, oh, we put in place new policies and practices, trust me, no one's going to trust them yet. They'll say, prove it. So we mm. talk about one of the theses talks about the arc of time, the arc of time. And Martin Luther King Jr. was fond of saying the arc of time bends towards justice. So we talk in the paper in a couple of our, our two of the theses about how do we use this arc of time or how do we steward the arc of time? How do we be good stewards or trustees, very strong um, important languages that don't just have fiduciary means, but sort of social contract or covenantal meanings. How do we steward the time when you're rebuilding? But when I talk with different executives, and I think PMI would agree, and others that I've talked to in different industry sectors that are trying to rebuild trust, restore trust, they will all say, I say, unless you're talking about at least a seven-year march, a seven-year journey, don't even bother, because it mm. takes it takes time. And you're going to have highs and lows. And frankly, you're going to have to bring back the trust of sometimes of the people in your own organization uh, that, that may have lost trust in leadership or feel the organization has lost its way or it's out of touch with society's new moves. So we, we talk, well, another thesis talks about, in fact, on that point about, uh, which comes again from these traditions, about like, care for the other as well as care for the self. So we often think of those who might have been injured, but how do we do self-care? Because some employees might feel guilty saying, oh, I work for a company that makes XYZ product. And their friends might say, oh, how could you work for them? Well, how do we take care of our people? How can they be excited to be part of a transformation? So there's there's different different ways that uh, we can help make it uh, invisible again. But one thing we did get conclude is that some people, you're just never going to change your mind. Their hurt is so mm. deep or perhaps their stubbornness uh, or whatever. They're just never, you, you could do anything and they won't change your mind. So you have to allow for uh, the, the imp what, what we called one of the religious traditions called imperfect apologies and imperfect forgiveness. So imperfect apologies, imperfect forgiveness. Um, but but with stewarding it properly, we believe it's it's worth the journey. And the alternative to just try to, if you use the phrase, to lawyer up or to hide behind the law or contracts, that tends not to do a lot to build rebuild trust. And frankly, we don't even think you could restore trust. Like the injury is done. No one's going to forget it. So we're not to really talking about restoration, which was the title with a question mark after it. We're talking about how rebuilding. How can we, okay, the, the house is broken. Let's take apart the, the bad parts. And how do we begin on a solid foundation rebuilding trust so that someday we don't even think about it? 
Thank you. And I love the reference to uh, Martin Luther King's arc of time. That's, that's beautiful. Also reminds me of a quote from Mandela who says, you don't win or lose, you win or learn. And hopefully <laughs> learnings on the timeline of the seven year journey you talk about um, yeah. can be had as you sort of, you know, rebuild the house with the, maybe with the, with the Lego block. Jane, you know, I'd love to ask you on this, on, on, on this, um, you know, you work with, um, the world's you know, largest brands in the world. And it would be interesting to know um, from your experience if you've had examples of brands that have lost that, that trust and perhaps what has been their seven year or maybe more a multi-decade journey perhaps to rebuild. Does, does anything come to mind um, that could give us a perspective? Up front? Yeah. yeah, Freddie, I, I think that before I'm talking about the example, I want to reflect what uh, David uh, was talking about is very difficult. It's almost impossible to restore. It has to be. It, it is a process of uh, rebuilding. Mm. But also, when we think about this process of rebuilding in a context which is relational culture, like in Asia, I think the time takes even longer. And mm. also, it has to go much deeper. Now, I think one of the things COVID this year has fundamentally also changed. If I take China as example, is that how consumer have raised their expectation on brand. Before, I think we, when consumers in, in China and Asia talk about brands, there is an expectation of brand integrity and about how brand deliver trustworthy product. But here this year, I think Adam in October just released a, a report talking about almost 88% of consumers expect the brands to behave properly during the COVID. They actually punish brand and saying that they actually talk their friends not to buy certain brands, almost 84% not to buy certain brands if they believe those brands do not support proper measurement in the COVID, therefore has to, uh, you know, create a damaged society. I think this, this COVID crisis, crisis actually um, accelerate consumer expectation on brand and make the expectation higher, but also not about the product, but also about the brand has to be a problem solver and being contributing to society. So if I look at this, I think that one of the example I remember was years ago, like in 2012 and 13, that was the time, there was a period of time when uh, food crisis, food safety crisis has been very um, severe in China. And KFC uh, had a PR crisis at that time because of the, the food supplier and it was proven was not okay and so on. It took KFC years to rebuild it's simply because the remember in the beginning when I talk when I talk about the, the, the trust, my observation of the trust in Asia has a lot to do with the safety. So the safety is the core. And when that core has been damaged, it takes much longer than any of the, the factors that needs to be rebuilt. So it took KFC years until they rebuilt. But they did actually put a lot of effort on transparency about how they actually make the process accountable, how they make sure that the consumer get to know every single detail of the process so they show everything out in order to rebuild. And they also recognize the mistake. It's almost like I break the covenant with the society. I have to rebuild that. It's not about just install a new machine tomorrow. It cannot be rebuilt. It has to be rebuilt over a long time, it took them years until they came back. And they do come back. It's one of the leading brands in China, but nobody is thinking about what happened in 2012 and 13. It was a long journey for this brand to come back. But the second, uh, second cases, recent cases, was, uh, was a DMT. Probably many people know about that. This fashion brand that uh, Governor uh, in 2018 had made a mistake. And that mistake has has caused severe backfire of the trust of the consumer to this brand. And I would say that has caused them a lot in terms of the business. And this, this business hasn't been really reviewed till now because they're still in the process of rebuilding. So what I'm saying is that I see in Asian culture, when that trust is broken, the, the relational culture is the fundamental. It takes much longer for brands to be reviewed. You know, can I just mention something briefly? I was struck by uh, this, this phenomenon of time. In fact, one of our 11 theses talks about the, the vector of time. And, and wisdom traditions, 
they don't think in terms of quarterly returns or annual shareholder returns or earnings per share. They think in, in not just years or generations, but even in eternity, if you will. So there's a, a whole different vector of time. And I think in the Asian cultures you're describing, there's, there's much more appreciation for uh, time uh, and, and the importance of time. And again, that doesn't mean we could sit still and assume time will heal these things. But how do we use that time? How do we steward that time? I think sometimes companies get impatient, like, well, we made restitution. We've, we've bought new machines, as you said, Jane. We've got better controls and everything's fine. So why don't people trust us? Well, sorry, <laughs> we want to watch. So I think there's a, an extra patience has to be required by boards and leaders, leadership, the C-suite executives, to endure what might feel like unfair criticism, even if they are, quote, unquote, better and now trustworthy. Only, they're only trustworthy when people say they are, and that may take years. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I mean, the 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 time continuing aspect is is really fascinating. You talked about seven years, sometimes maybe decades. Um, I mean, I suppose it, it depends. Felipe, I'm interested to turn it to you. Um, Jane did a, a really good job at connecting the aspect of safety with trust. Very relevant, obviously, for for the industry that you're in. And yours is a trust with civil society. So, how, what about the issues of safety with civil society? How do you how do you deal with that in, in your company? Felipe, I think you are on mute. Oops. We still can't hear you. That's interesting. We still can't hear you. Try again. No, we've lost you. We see you, just you know, we can't hear you. Can you hear us? You can, can hear us. You. you can hear us, but we can't hear you anymore. Something's happened to your sound. Maybe um, sign in and sign out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll we'll pick it we'll pick it up when you when you come back or maybe change your headset. So David, we'll 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 go to you and and maybe talk a little bit about um, perhaps some of the other uh, wisdom traditions. And I, I I like how you put those. We've covered quite a few already. We've talked about um, transparency. We've talked about uh, care, self care, and other care. The covenantal not uh, mindset. Um, I was hoping that maybe you could touch on on, on some others. Um, I have them uh, as a list here in, in front of me. I like the idea of the institutional ritual. I was wondering if you could perhaps talk a little bit about yeah. that. What are those rituals that institutions have to have to really be more mindful of? Well, one of the, the things that particularly ancient religions have in common, uh, but also uh, others, is is this phenomenon of rituals. And sometimes I think we get bored with the ritual, like, oh, we have to say this again or do this again or whatever the action or words might be that the community does together. Well, it's a way of remembering. In fact, it was a, one of the women we talked to is from Kenya. Uh, she was the one who made this point that she talked in different African spiritualities that there are rituals that, that help communities remember some of their pain, but also remember some of the healing and the promises that their God gave them. And so that got me thinking, wow, that's really interesting. You're right. And, well, could companies do an analogous thing? So what would a, a company ritual look like? One company I know, it's, it's not KFC, it's interesting, you mentioned them, Jane, and it's in, they're in the food sector, they're one of the largest um, uh, U.S. producers and global producers of protein products, beef, pork, pork, poultry, and pork, and they, when you go into their corporate headquarters, there's, it's, it's a bit of a labyrinth that you go through where it's from the, the founder of 100 years ago to the different owners and so forth and the different people, but it also puts pictures up of things that were problematic of some negative times in their history. So they're being honest about their story. It's not all pretty and perfect. So maybe companies can mm. find ways, whether it's through having in their, in their head office a, a wall uh, that tells this story. Uh, maybe it's uh, an annual day that they choose to remember some critical moments in their history and what they learned from them. And maybe the CEO sends out a note to that effect every year or as part of your onboarding of all new employees, all big companies have different training programs to onboard and to transfer the culture to say, you know, our story has not always been a perfect one. So there's a ritual of telling the story. Uh, so that I was just, I, I've seen very few companies think of this or do this on their own uh, intuitively. So there's a, perhaps a very stark example of how a, a religious custom or tradition of rituals or liturgies, someone might say, could be incorporated in a obviously a contextually appropriate 
way based on the company, the industry, the, the part of the world we're in. But I, that struck Thank me as uh, fresh. Thank you. These are really great, uh, great suggestions. The history wall, the annual day, uh, onboarding approaches. I was also thinking perhaps referencing founders. You see a lot of companies typically yeah. have you know, founder uh, citations uh, to bring us back to, to the past, whether it is to celebrate it or maybe transcend it in, in some form. Um, Felipe, do we, do we have you back with us right now? Oh, we still cannot still hear. I can't hear you. So sorry. Maybe we will uh, ask you questions with thumbs up and thumbs down. <laughs> <laughs> so we can go to A, A or B. I think something's happened to your um, wireless headset. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I wanted to kind of close the conversation uh, with a, a question, actually, that Philippe had uh, proposed. So thank you, Philippe. Sorry if you can't vote on it. Um, which was, you know, given how... Uh, under scrutiny trust is uh, nowadays. Um, I was eager to ask everyone if you can think of someone who might be a reference for trust today. Uh, that's a difficult question. Anybody come to mind um, in the world today as representing this very elusive and, and difficult um, commodity, which is, which is trust? Um, Jane, anyone come to, to your mind? Well, I, I would definitely say that the, the prime minister in New Zealand is one of the candidates. I say it's not so much about the policy, it's about how she handled and um, taking the crisis to, to, to bring that transparency and, and also affirmation to the community. Thank you. And it builds well on the relationship you were making between safety and trust, of course, being one of the first countries to have been able to tackle uh, COVID with zero cases. Um, that's obviously lent her a lot of uh, trust with, with, her, with her constituents. Um, David, anyone come, come to mind, perhaps not even maybe someone of the contemporaries, perhaps someone from, um, from the past in terms of being a <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I, I think people who... Uh, who you just feel trust, they, they, they exude trust or trustworthiness, they, they tend to have a common characteristic, and that's they have passion for what they're doing. It's clear they care, and it's not just their own self and reputation. They care about the consumer, the end user, the partner, whoever is they, that they're, they're, they're client, if you will. They could be citizens. It could be. So, so, so there's passion, and there's also authenticity. So who is authentic? So one example, it's, it's about 10, 12 years ago uh, in the, some of you remember the, the Xerox company, which of course did not finally um, uh, uh, manage to survive the different technology changes. But at one point they did, and Anne Mulcahy was their CEO. She came in, a bit of a surprise appointment. She had been a career as Xerox person. And in her first press conference, she essentially said, um, we're in deep trouble. <laughs> Our cash flow is drying up. And we're going to have to have major layoffs just to survive. And, of course, the stock tanked the next day and all her advisors and consultants and everyone beat her up. So you shouldn't do that. But that was the beginning of the first time the market began to trust Xerox after years of distrusting them. And sure enough, within about six months, the stock price was back up where it had been when she first said that. And then she had a, a terrific run uh, and for several years as CEO. So, so being willing to say the unpopular thing uh, as opposed to what people want to hear, that's a sign of trust. But we also could look at um, uh, obviously some religious figures. Every tradition has different figures that they they uh, they lionize or they they make uh, uh, part of the lore. But even those great figures often had mistakes. So I'm actually very reluctant to say someone suggest anyone would be perfect. Uh, but that but the attributes we look for is is I would say passion and authenticity, uh, and they will mm -hmm. tell you news tell you news even if you don't want to hear it. But somehow they still leave you with hope. Like, I'm working on it. We're working on it. I think, Felipe, that's what your CEO has been trying to do for years. Like, yeah, we have a lot of things we need to fix, but we are working on it. Uh, and is it going to be linear? No. That's, again, one of the things we learned from our, our, uh, our research. It will not be linear. You will have backward steps, and you have to be willing to um, ride those out through the vector of time. I think these, these are great, recognizing <laughs> the passion, the authenticity. Yes, Felipe is, is in agreement with us. But also having the, the courage to maybe uh, say things that are unspoken yeah. and are non-popular. Uh, I think yeah. that that is, um, that is very refreshing. Um, and, you know, we are uh, going to be closing soon, but um, just looking towards the future, I'm struck by how many companies are now 
really moving much more towards um, sort of the corporate purpose area. Um, mm. Jane, I was, I was keen to maybe ask you, as, as you work with your clients, what about this uh, agenda of, of building more corporate purposes? Companies try to be more relevant, not just to shareholders, but to mm-hmm. employees and communities at large. What are your thoughts about building trust through, through corporate purpose? I, I think let's go back to the fundamental of being authentic because the corporate purpose has been really the high agenda. Almost every single big company is talking about that. But bear in mind that the, the observation from the consumer, they look at the people look at it with a very a skeptical uh, through a se- skeptical lens. Is this real? Is this really connected with the brand? Is really from the bottom of the heart of the brand wants to do something, or this is just PR? I see in the in the in the time right now, any corporate um, social cause needs to be very core to the brand and being authentic. Otherwise, this actually could backfire because yeah. um, the consumer can be very cynical and say, look, I do not, not only I don't buy in, I just think that you are trying to cover up something by doing something seemingly good. So I think being authentic is super, super important right now. You know, Jane, you just touched on that's That's a, yeah, so thumbs up, <laughs> double thumbs up. The, the, I think it's our thesis number nine, which actually talks about coming again from different wisdom traditions. Who is your God? Let's say the small G or whatever, but, uh, and do you have false gods or false idols? So if a company says we're trying to do all these wonderful things, but they're not, that really all they want to do is just make more money and making money is fine. There's nothing wrong with that, but at least being honest about it. So, so one of the things we've challenged companies is to say what your stated purpose is, does it really stack up to reality? And if there's a gap, a differential, then you're going to have your trust will be harmed. It certainly will not be rebuilt. Yeah. Great. Well, I want to tr- really thank everybody on the panel today uh, for your excellent conversations and, and pointers. Um, good to know that expectations have been raised. So for all of those who have followed the panel, be, be warned. Um, please be sure to read David's paper uh, towards a restoration of trust, the 11 uh, thesis of restoration, or I would say of rebuilding uh are uh, great. So thank you for joining us today and um, have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.